Good morning, good evening, good whatever time you're listening to this podcast. My name is James Alban, and welcome to episode 31 of The Last Line. Thank you very much for joining me. On today's episode, uh, you will hear my conversation with comedy actress and writer Ellie White. I spoke to Ellie at the start of this year, and um, as you'll hear uh, over the course of the next hour or so, um, it was quite a rambly conversation um, that, you know, encompasses some of Ellie's work, as you would expect from a uh, good podcast interview, but also went off in various tangents, um, including a long extended segment about some of Ellie's favorite uh, reality TV shows. Uh, from the early noughties. That uh, is all to come. So without further ado, here is Ellie White. You look like you're in a sort of whole recording studio. I'm definitely not. This is my living room. Um, like this is the, the end you. of the living room and then this is my girlfriend's keyboard very Those nice are my guitars there and then that's my girlfriend's desk so yeah so do not... you do everything in the same room uh well yeah <laughs> we don't really... <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no choice yeah there's no we don't really have any other room really like our <laughs> flat's not like badly sized but it's only like a one bedroom thing so yeah so, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's 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 all painful, isn't it? Really. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we're we're sort of we we in the same room when we're doing stuff, but that's fine. Well, although she's confined to the bedroom for now. Yeah. Well, snap. Although I would have quite liked to have seen her sort of just carrying on with her work in the background, <laughs> just eviling you over her shoulder. That would have been quite nice. Um. Thank you for doing this. No, it's a pleasure. Um. I don't know if you know anything about the podcast or anything well i read i read up about it and um (laughs) yeah and i just came on here to tell you that i'm not gonna do it oh cool great uh (laughs) well it's nice to meet you Um, (laughs) and goodbye cool so yeah so i guess you kind of know what it is i mean it's i yes like i mean you've done adam buxton's so um like that's basically the was the inspiration for this really because i'm a massive adam buxton fan so um he's a good he's a good guy although i keep on i'm watching line of duty at the moment and there's a um there's a police officer in it called buckles (laughs) and every inspector buckles and every time he says his name i'm just like this is surely someone needs to needs to go in and change his name (laughs) because it's it's like a silly name and you've just now called the police officer (laughs) inspector buckles is that just makes me think that Adam's just going to come out <laughs> and start like talking about something? Is that the new series that everyone's going on? No, about, I, I, I I saw that a new series was coming out, and then I was like, I haven't watched any of Line of Duty. I think I've seen so, like one series, but I don't know. Well, which. I started this time last week. Okay. And bearing in mind they're hour-long episodes, yeah. I'm I'm halfway through series four. Wow, that's good going. <laughs> and that that's worrying. Because then you know how much time I have on my hands. Yeah, but it's lockdown. That's what everyone's doing, isn't it? Like, just just watching TV. I mean, I did the whole of... Last lockdown, I did the whole of Shit's Creek. And that's like... Yeah, is that is that good? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I, I've only seen, like, little snippets, but I, I haven't can, seen whole episodes. It's... it's um, I think it's just one of those shows that is just sort of like... Um just so lovely you know what i mean like yeah um i'm not in a because that could also make it sound quite boring Mm -hmm. um but it's still people often are very boring it's still very funny but um yeah just like it's impossible i think to not sort of like fall in love with the characters and all that kind of stuff um yeah well he's i mean they're those two together like Catherine o'hara and is she Catherine? Yeah. Is it Catherine O'Hara? Yeah. yeah, and Dan Levy. Like from Best in Show and um, what's it called? Waiting for Guffman. Mm. 
like all of that stuff is just genius so you're like well it's a no-brainer yeah it's great it, it's worth <laughs> it's worth i mean it's obviously there's a lot but at least you know it, it ends because i yeah. can't start is that his shows, son dan levy's son that's so eugene levy's the dad and dan, oh, sorry sorry dan eugene levy's the son. Levy, i mean yeah. sorry i meant eugene levy yeah and dan, Le- dan dan levy's the son and then but he is his actual son in real life yeah and they wrote it together and then, and then their sister, uh, Dan Levy's sister and Eugene Levy's daughter is also in it, but doesn't play Dan Levy's sister. She plays the waitress in the cafe in the town. It's um, a family affair. Yeah. It's, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's, it's worth watching. I just, Although I, just I hate recommending like... things because now you're going to probably watch it and be like, oh, awful. <laughs> It's awful, isn't it? So I'll recommend something you don't like. And it's like, do I like them less now? Do I sort of respect <laughs> them less for telling me that thing? Um, no, I, I, I have been recommended it a number of times, so we'll watch it. But I do have that awful thing as well, where if enough people talk about a show, I don't want to watch it or a film. I'm like, yeah, um, yeah. And that is like, that is silly and stupid. And I actually like, find people annoying when they do it but i definitely do that all the time i think so you you want to be the first person on something that's really good or you just don't want to watch it yeah so it's it's one or the other and no i agree i think it's uh i think it's a sort of yeah once something gets overhyped you're just going to sit there sort of bitterly taking it apart rather than just sort of enjoying it yeah and like just but that's the problem though. But like, I shouldn't be like that. I should just be positive and be like, yeah, oh, I can see why everyone loves it rather than sitting there going, oh, well, it's not as good as everyone says it is because the camera work is like, you know? I know, but I, th- I feel like that's part of being a sort of comedian writer. You've got like an ingrained sense of jealousy and anger and bitterness inside your horrible, black, twisted brain. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much <laughs> yep um, you can't enjoy anything without being cynical about it no. I, I, I don't actually you know like I think I, I I do watch a lot of comedy and I love watching comedy but I I tend to watch things that are really far away from stuff that I'm doing or trying to make okay that's interesting so like I'll, I'll watch like, you know, four seasons of Parks and Rec. So I'm like, it's an American show and they have like a whole team full of writers. Yeah. Whereas if I'm like, oh, it's a sketch group that's like, I know. I'm like, oh, I just get, I just get too jealous. <laughs> I just like, oh God, I wish I thought of that. Oh, damn, that's good. Oh, it's genius. Oh, it's better than anything I could do. I'm a piece of shit. I'll throw myself into a well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can. The nearest well. I can relate to that, I think. <laughs> Um, I don't know whether it's okay to admit that or whether I'll email you in two days and say, cut Can that, you cut that out. off the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fine to admit. I think everyone has that, don't they? Like, yeah. I mean, I think we should try not to be like that, but it's. Impossible. Yeah, because I think, I think, I think when you're in a good place and you watch something that's brilliant, you're like, it's inspiring, it's fantastic, it's a piece of art. When you're in a bad place and you're watching something brilliant, it's very like in, internalized. And well, you will never make anything like that. You're a piece of shit. You should go and fall in a well. And it's all essentially ego based. Yeah, and also with me, and this this probably doesn't apply to you because you're probably much more productive than me. Although you have admitted that you've spent the last <laughs> week watching line of duty so i don't know it's productive um, in a way <laughs> but, yeah uh, yeah it is um but i i think a lot of the time i'm like watching a show that or or a film or or i've seen someone that like one of my something that one of my friends has done or something and i'm i'm filled with that sort of jealous like i should be doing better <laughs> Thing. yeah and then i go yeah, yeah but then like actually like they're, they're actually doing it so just get off your ass and do it james because otherwise- yeah i think i think you can either use it to drag yourself down into a kind of you know essentially like narcissistic ball of pain yeah which is the can, majority like- of the time with me yeah, yeah 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 
or you can sort of, you know, put your, as I like to call them, blinders on and just think uh, uh, that thing has nothing to do with my thing. So I'll just concentrate on my thing. Yeah. And I think remembering where you are in comparison to everyone else is difficult. And like the things yeah. you have done and stuff. Yeah. It, it, it's just it's just an industry and like broader industry that is horribly set up for like judgment and comparison. Like there's no there's no like getting around that and you have to be so focused to sort of um like everyone everyone falls victim to that. Everyone, I I'd say. But I think there's probably stuff you can do to help yourself. I don't know what they are. I mean, I definitely use this podcast as almost like a therapy session for myself. Yeah, I was just about to say, like, this does already (laughs) feel like therapy. Uh, (laughs) If if this is what therapy is like, it's incredibly cathartic. It consists of me getting people on the show that I'm fans of and like the work of and going... Yeah, but like you, you feel the same way as me, right? Like it's not all in my head. And I go, no, I don't. Yeah. I really don't. What? And you really need to work on yourself. Well, we've managed to do 11 <laughs> minutes of a podcast you said you weren't going to do about 11 minutes ago. So that's good. Um, um, uh, I guess this feeds. So basically, I say this to everyone. Have, we, have this podcast started? I guess so. It, it, it feels like yeah. it started. I always do like an intro and outro later mm, anyway mm, but it feels much, like we've kind much. of started doesn't it really um big time um but i will say to everyone yeah. that i talk to this i say the mm. same thing which is probably not the right thing to say given the conversation we just had but yeah. I, I always start with a sort of slight apology in the fact that i don't have like a set list of questions and i just sort of no no that's that's fantastic and so the the thing i always say is if you get bored Mm. um you can just tell just me slowly slowly <laughs> shut my yeah or do that um and and we'll pretend it never happened and you can just go on about your <laughs> life um, um i guess that kind of feeds into though because i was listening to you on adam buxton's podcast again which was mainly you two going through the lyrics of wap but yeah um <laughs> <laughs> that definitely wasn't there were I don't think there were any questions in that 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 conversation. I don't remember a single question being <laughs> asked. <laughs> but you did mention that you're not on social media. Which yes. is that still the case? And I guess that if you well, if you are or are not, like that mm-hmm. kind of feels relevant from what we're talking about, about comparing yourself to other people and all that kind of... Yeah, for sure. I think... No, I'm not on Twitter or Instagram. For some bizarre reason, I still kept my Facebook. And I think it was out of like... (laughs) That's like the first one that most people... (laughs) Because I find it really funny. I didn't mean to pull a visual face. That that face was supposed to stay in my mind, not... Yeah, for... for, Yes, you you like narrowed your eyes and looked at me like... Facebook? What? What? Um, I think it's because it's so irrelevant that I mm. find it like quite entertaining because the only people that post on there are people that I don't know or like <laughs> I met when I was traveling when I was 18 or something like that yeah. or a school, an old school friend. So I find it quite strangely um, like entertaining going on it and being and seeing like mad like um, kind of political rants from some like That's person I met <laughs> 12 years ago <laughs> or a photo of a dog and I'm like who I, I t- spent like five minutes looking at it being like who is that oh yeah she was two years below me at school I remember her um, but no I don't have Twitter or Instagram and I haven't for nearly three years and um, I would just really recommend it not having it really and that's all i'm gonna say no that's um... i mean i can certainly i can certainly see why you would say that but i haven't taken the plunge no i i i I totally understand i think i think uh, mine was honestly a completely rash mad decision there wasn't any like calculate calculated you know um i didn't like put it in my diary or like lead up to it or even go like, I'll just delete it off my phone and then steadily come off it. I honestly woke up one morning and was like, I'm going to delete all my accounts. 
like my eyes as wide as that and delete all my accounts. And I, no reason, for no reason, I was just like, I'm gonna do it. I just gonna do it. And then I did. And then I was like, cool. And then I don't think it had any effect on, on me uh, apart from probably feeling a bit less anxious. Right. Which is good. I'm feeling a bit like my mum is still on Instagram and she'll call me up and be like, I saw that all your friends were at a birthday party <laughs> the weekend, but you weren't in the photo. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great. I wasn't invited. Fantastic. <laughs> and, I, and I found out about it through my mum. So stuff like that is interesting and coming to terms with, you know, not being invited to things is tough. But I think it's it's been a good thing for my head because I tend to number one get addicted to stuff so I was like looking at it a lot yeah and like being obsessed with it and also being kind of I went through a phase of like trying to tweet really like funny stuff like trying to be like a comedian on Twitter I've thought about doing that and then never done it Yeah, yeah and I found that I was writing sort of 25 drafts of tweets and being like, okay, I'll drop this one at 10 a.m. And then I'll wait an hour and then I'll drop the next one. And then ugh, if it didn't get five likes and if it, didn't, if it only got like five likes, then I'd be like, delete it, delete it. You know, it was, it, was, it became a sort yeah. of obsession. And I was like, who am I doing this for? Who, who, who am I really doing this for? And then, you know, the Instagram thing of seeing people working and feeling like shit and then when you are working being like, I have to put stuff up on Instagram to prove that I'm working, to prove that I'm doing well. It was, it was just unhealthy for me. And so I think that's, that's what stimulated the, um, the delete. Yeah. My girl, my girlfriend's on, um, TikTok now as well. Yeah. Um, that's, that's tough to hear. And, (laughs) (laughs) and it's definitely become, uh, I mean, you know, to be, you know, to be fair, she's, she's done it to try and sort of promote her art and her music and all that kind of stuff. No, but I it does, understand. But it does become, and I, yeah, she would admit this as well. Um, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. Uh, and she doesn't listen to the podcast anyway, so even if I am, um, I'll get away <laughs> with it. Um, I think she would admit that it, it becomes an obsession. Like, why why is this one only I got think- like three? Why is this one I've spent ages doing and you got three likes? And why is this one yeah. I just did? of my face got like 20 likes or something you know so i think that can be quite a toxic place to be in Mm. however um so many people are like putting like such good things on instagram and tiktok and and twitter like um you know it has a name but even in comedy you know like because no one's been able to do live gigs yeah and they've been I feel like loads of people have got like doing characters and stuff to camera or even like bits of stand up, your, your girlfriend's doing her music. And that is an amazing way to promote yourself. So if I was just starting out now, I probably would do that. Yeah. But I'm like so bad at it in terms of, yeah. that. I'm just, I, just and I know I something, should, like, I know I should, I know I should tweet about the podcast more. I know I should, but it's just like, it feels like you're shouting into a void of people. I and- know. I think it's hard because I, I, I feel huge amounts of shame um, every day. And I feel like when you, when you kind of promote yourself, it fills me with like absolute dread. So I think even when I was first starting doing comedy and I would put on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, I've got a gig, I'm doing a gig tonight, you know, here at this time, at this place, which is obviously necessary to kind of promote yourself. I felt sick just being like, oh God, who am I doing this for? Who's this for? Yeah. I, yeah, I, I can get And it's that. for, so people can see you and so that you can, I don't know, get an audience for what you're trying to do, which is make people laugh or make people feel something that's not just like a numbness void. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's beneficial and it's good, hopefully. But there's, there's also a sense of kind of, oh God, I don't know. I don't know. Anxiety, you know, shame. Yeah. Sort of just feeling like you're crap. So I think that it's, uh, 
that social media and like essentially it's just like you and a microphone and however many people want to listen and you're like oh god I've only got I've only got a hundred followers and so and so who I did a gig with last week has got 10,000 what am I doing wrong (laughs) yeah but also I guess it's good because you don't have to look at um like especially I, I feel like in like like lockdown and stuff i don't really want to talk about lockdown and especially because i think every mm, podcast mm. becomes about lockdown but mm. um i guess avoiding all of the constant conversation about things like that or yeah you know like at the moment if you open twitter all it is is um the uh harry and Meghan markle yeah thing, yeah right yeah I think it also makes you, I think it, I think hopefully it does make you more um, free thinking as well. Because I think it's very easy to be sucked into sort of mob mentality on, on social media as well. Like polarization and stuff like yeah. that. Whereas I can meet, I'm <laughs> superior, <laughs> make my own opinions about things. Whereas everyone else is a slave. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's good though. I'm good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad that it's going well. Um, I think that I basically think that if you if you don't if you don't have like a slightly obsessional mind, there's no harm in it. But if you do, it can be quite damaging. And that's that's the last thing I'm going to say on it today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think if I have an obsessional mind or not. I think I probably do. You probably do. Probably do. Um, it's hard not to, isn't it? Yeah. I think it is. I think if you're a sort of thinker, like it is, it is hard. To, like I think they're two sides of the same coin. I like being it's called like, a oh, thinker. Oh, you're create. You're, <laughs> you're a you're a thinker. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very very you know thoughtful, intelligent, creative person using the left side of your brain. Yeah. But it's a it's a double edged sword, and that can that sword can flip over and it can stab you in the back of the skull. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I used to like describe because I, I think when I was sort of growing up I didn't really know what like anxiety was but I was definitely very anxious in hindsight mm. and uh, I used to like describe the feeling of anxiety as like a bag of spiders being like shaken up inside my brain so if someone was like oh how are you feeling you, you seem a bit odd like you're lying face down on the floor like, I don't know a bag of spiders I've got a bag of spiders in my brain being shaken up and that was like a good sort of um, way of describing like how my brain felt when I was like anxious, just like, yeah, that, loads I like of spiders that. That, running around. That, that, that definitely fits, I think. Or like, or like a mouse, like a very scared mouse in a pair of high heels, like running around a hamster wheel. It's like, <laughs> ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, would it be fair to say taking a a complete detour away from social media that there is i've written here this is a great note i've written (laughs) i've I've written (laughs) darkness in comedy would Mm. you be fair to say because i've i've obviously just like as soon as i knew this was this was happening this yeah i i watched basically everything i could find of yours and right. um, I think, like, clearly, I noticed there's a darkness in your comedy. Would you, would that be fair to say? Um, it's, I've, I'm thinking, like, especially like your your and Natasha's work. I think. Yeah, like I think that we um, we <laughs> <laughs> the analogy that we use is that like everyone has. I don't know why I'm using so many so many animal analogies, but yeah, I'm gonna fine. I'm gonna like that can be the theme on. for today's podcast. The last but podcast I ha- did was about lions being <laughs> um, like bred for um, canned hunting. So you know what? Yeah, with who? Uh, a woman called Beth Jennings who runs a campaign about. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna go on detail now. Um, <laughs> She was a volunteer 
She, she, she went she went volunteering. She did one of these trips on her gap year where she paid like 1,500 quid to go and volunteer to look mm. after lions in South Africa at this like what they called was a, what they said was a sanctuary. Um, mm. But soon realized basically that a lot of these places that offer tourists the chance to go and like pet lions and stuff are actually yeah. then, you know, because you can't release those lions back yeah, into the wild. Yeah. So where are they going? They're probably going to canned hunting or the lion bone train and stuff. And so that's what God, the Like um, what she called Carol Baskin. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was a sort of front, wasn't it? Yeah. Her, kind of, her was, lion sanctuary. That was all a bit odd. I mean, that whole show yeah. was odd. That whole... It was wild. Yeah. I had a panic attack. I actually had a panic attack watching that show. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it was like just at the beginning of lockdown and it was so mad. I think something triggered. Something <laughs> triggered. So his mullet triggered something in me and I was like, no. Um, uh, yes. So we can continue okay. the theme of the animals. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So I... I yeah, probably. Like I, the thing is, I was never. I, you know, when you you start working on something or you start writing it, it and it is just stuff that comes from your head naturally. Mm. So you wouldn't go about being like, I'm going to make a dark comedy, sure. or like, I'm going to make a surreal comedy, or I'm going to make a broad comedy. I guess it's just what you feel naturally like is the funniest to yeah. you. Um. So. I, but I always found that like every character I was writing, I was like, God, they're just, they're really sad or like they're really, um, you know, they, 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 you can kind of predict a fall in them or like, you know, there's something that's like slightly tragic or something that's like e inherently like a bit evil about them. That was just like coming through. And then Tash and I like discussed it loads and we were kind of like, oh shit, like, we love we, we're obsessed with snakes because we find them really funny and like people who keep snakes <laughs> <laughs> and why snakes are like sexy like i don't know why we both find that funny and then we were like everyone has a snake inside them but some people have like a very small like almost like glow worm or like a you know grass <laughs> snake that's not dangerous and right. some people like have king cobra <laughs> <laughs> so some people are like you know you, you just have a, a little snake that maybe comes out sometimes you know like when you're waiting too long for your food and you're like please sorry can, can the food come and then some people are like king cobra i.e like really manipulative and like psych slightly psychopathic right but everyone has the ability for their sort of snake demon to come through okay and i guess what i'm trying to say is we're both king cobras <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's why we're drawn to doing darker stuff no I, I don't know I don't know I think we just found it funny but I mean it's a difficult Ash. thing to sorry it's a difficult thing to answer I guess because like you said you don't set out with these things but no, as someone you don't who overanalyzes these things and I'm watching it I'm like yeah there's a definitely a sort of um, like you think about like internet nails or yes. the the uh, American sexy girls. Or... Yeah, yeah. Well, oddly, we so we started doing that because we were both doing those characters separately. So I was doing like a very nervous Eastern European woman, and Tash was doing kind of like a quite overtly sexual sort of Eastern European woman. And we were like, oh, would it be funny if they were on stage together? Like maybe we can write something around them and they want, they're desperate to go to America and there's a sort of, you know, slightly tragic, like lack of self-awareness about them or something like that. So we started gigging and we started doing that and we, we were like, oh, you know, this is, this is great and this is really fun. And then I remember someone coming up to us after a show and he was this like quite sort of trendy, like, writer from vice oh and he like introduced himself he, he would like, be oh, trendy vice. writing from, for vice wouldn't he <laughs> yeah and he yeah. was like i'm from vice and you know i, I really loved your set it was really really interesting um not f he didn't say it was funny he was like it was very interesting you know obviously it represents the sex trade you know the, the illegal trafficking and the sex trade and we were like good god <laughs> 
we can't do that <laughs> sketch ever again if that's what people are thinking we're doing. He was like, you know, you've got Ellie at the back who's kind of, you know, she's kept there against her will. And then you've kind of got, you know, Tasha's character at the front who's sort of, you know, she's probably illegally brought her here from Eastern Europe and she's keeping her in a cellar. And, you know, you have this huge juxtaposition between you and it's all about dominance and, you know, people being taken against their will and consent. And we were like, oh no, what's happened? It's just supposed to be funny. <laughs> I don't think we did. We, we, we definitely didn't do it for like a good six months after that because we were so scarred by the conversation. <laughs> yeah, but don't you think that also makes it sound like amazingly like cutting edge and like we're saying something about uh maybe thing. we're making a statement and even though you're not um <laughs> you just thought yeah it was funny. i think we were just nervous we, we we just became very nervous about it and we were like i think that we because this because the stuff that we come up with we don't we're quite aware that we don't ever really want to be making like huge sort of political statements sure. with it we were like, oh God, is this, I don't know. It, it just became confusing to us, like are the, if we were treading the right line or not. Right. And if we were yeah. like being incredibly inflammatory or <laughs> like insensitive to women who'd been trafficked, like all of that kind of stuff. It was like, <laughs> God, what have we done? It just, yeah, it just was sort of a nightmare. But I think that it naturally to me makes me laugh when things take that kind of turn um so i suppose that even you know like something like the office yeah. with like ricky gervais i wouldn't say the office was dark but he is a sort of sad character isn't he yeah. really and there's definitely so I like, a, a darkness to it isn't there you know yeah i like quite... the ability that someone that that you know like in a really, really, really simplistic way, like to me, the funniest thing is someone falling, like someone falling over, yeah. like just fall. <laughs> I watched a video this morning, in fact, of like a woman, like an old lady who'd been taken skydiving and she, she's like really, really, really scared. And then she's like really reluctant to go out of the plane. She's strapped to this guy behind her, but she's really reluctant to go out of the plane. But then when she does, she's like, dang, somehow she's got her body into a position where she's like, looks like she's completely fallen out of her harness. Not to the point where she's going to fall out, but she's in such a precarious position yes. that I was crying <laughs> with laughter. <laughs> crying with laughter about it. So I don't know what, I don't know what that says about me, but. But I think like well, you mentioned the office and, uh, like the American office, like for a lot of people uh, that you speak to, they seem to have only seen the American office and not really seen the mm. British one. Or if they're big fans of the American office, I mean, I, I, I mean, the British office to me is like one of my all time favorite mm, mm. sitcoms. Uh, I really enjoy the American office, but I don't like hold it up in as, as high a regard sort of thing. But yeah. I feel like uh, when I speak to a lot of people, they go, oh, I really like the American office, but I just didn't really get the British office. Like, it's not funny. It's not like... Yeah. And it's maybe Yeah, because it's so of, painful. Yeah, because it is just, at times, just horrendously like... Yeah, but I love... But but I, I mean, what, I have to say, like, that is... That I love that. I mean, it's it's... I suppose it's the com like for me the the kind of first comedy that I found, you know, like I, with my parents and stuff that I used to love watching like Blackadder and like Smack the Pony and stuff like that. But the first stuff that I found like on my own was was like the day to day and Brass Eye and like Jam and all that Chris yeah. Morris stuff. So I was like, um, oh my god! I, I just it felt like so exciting to me watching that. I was like, this is the most inspiring thing ever like just to have that just to be able to like satirize stuff and have that kind of level of weird like dark stuff that's making me and it's so original to me and so unique and very inspiring and I've never been more boring or serious talking about anything but <laughs> <laughs> the office is the same but although I came to that a bit later it's like she's like it's so painful but yeah. so funny and, and and you know people like that 
and yeah. you, you've been in those situations and it's like ass clenching whereas the american office is like a brilliant sitcom that's like really like you know it's a bit more sentimental a bit more warm and a bit more easy to watch yeah yeah you can you can sort of binge the amount i mean i'm doing it at the moment because i've realized i never actually watched it to like the very end mm. which is like part like even past when steve carell leaves which i think a lot yeah. of people say is like not like when it sort of starts to go downhill but um but i haven't got there yet but um yeah it's incredibly easy just to sort of binge and have on in the background and not even on the background because that that sounds unfair but like just to have on you <laughs> turn know it on like, while you sleep yeah. just turn it on while you sleep go to sleep and then wake up and turn it off <laughs> <laughs> whereas the whereas like i i i i I probably watched the British office like all the way through maybe like once every other year or something. Like, yeah, I'm yeah, at, me, like, too. me too. I'll watch it from I start watched to finish. The, I watched the Christmas special like every Christmas. Oh, yeah. It, nice. Like it's yeah. my sort of home alone, I guess. Although the other day I watched the extras Christmas special. Oh, yeah. Have you seen that? Yes. Which I'm I waiting to see if you if you like it or not before I go. Yeah, no, I, I love I love yeah, it. No, I, yeah, it's, I thought it was, it's so good. But that um, that I haven't seen for years and years, and that is way more like like Ricky Gervais, like like we know him now, kind of thing. Yeah, but it's still so funny, and actually made me cry. Is that that is the Christmas special where he is on Big Brother? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is good. And it's just Lionel so... Blair is just dancing all the time. <laughs> it's so painful. And then and he actually did him end up... His agent. He actually did end up doing it, didn't he? Lionel Blair. Ended up oh, doing Celebrity he? Big Brother like years later. Oh, God. I just... I... Like, Big Brother to me is also... Like, those kinds of reality shows are also, like, perfect comedies. Like, the... the that Big Brother... Um, uh, you know, when the David's dead, the celebrity big brother David's dead. <laughs> David dead. That is scream worthy. <laughs> I'd forgotten like, about that. <laughs> but like those kind of those kinds of shows, the the um uh the one that, that Tash and I like always come back to is Totally Scott Lee, which is a um which is about Lisa Scott Lee um, making a comeback on her solo. Um, was she? Who, like, which band was she in? Was she here? Steps. So, Steps. Okay. So she was in Steps, and this is a documentary, like a reality TV show made. I think it was in two thousand and six or two thousand and five, which is about her like solo comeback, and it's made by MTV. And like the jeopardy in it, which I cannot believe she agreed to, and it's wild is that she agrees to MTV that she'll do this documentary which will follow her behind the scenes as she tries to get a top 10 hit. But if she doesn't get a top 10 hit, she has to give up music forever. (laughs) 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 And it is... It is... It is like the Office Christmas special. Like, it's her doing, like club sets in like oh, no. horrible places and she has this manager who is also trying to relaunch his career he was in a band called Back of Beyond in like the 80s he's trying to relaunch his career her brother is trying to launch his solo career and he's going out with Michelle from Liberty X who's like <laughs> in the peak of who's like in the peak of her career he's being like really like bitchy behind the scenes and it's sort of before reality TV became a kind of monetized yeah. like you know love island influencer thing and it's really just basic and loads of like stupid stuff happens and there's just so many times when her and her husband are in their like um dressing gowns with sort of glasses of prosecco being like oh and like eating eating like a nice meal in the house being like this is lovely isn't it babe we just don't get time to do this because her husband is doing a national tour of starlight express on ice <laughs> and remember, like every other day the sun newspaper comes through the door and like on the back page it's like her husband pictured with another woman and she's like i just don't believe it i don't believe it 
I want to try and see. You can watch it on YouTube. Oh, brilliant. It's all on YouTube, yeah. Because I've been, I went down a rabbit hole on YouTube recently watching. uh, Do you remember that weird show about pineapple dance studios? Yeah, Louis Spence. Louis Spence, but um, I can't believe I just accidentally did the list there when I wasn't even intending to on Louis Spence. That's really bad. I'm going to cut that. Um, I'll say it again. Louis Spence. Oh, yes. Louis Spence. Um, <laughs> um, but the other guy who was like the main character was yeah. like Andrew is he Stone. An- Andrew. Andrew. Andrew Stone. Stone Starman. That yeah. is like... I, that, that, like you see some people and it's a bit similar to like the Bross documentary. I don't know if you saw that. Yes. Where yes. you're like, yeah. do you know what you're doing? Do, well, are you trying all... to be Brent or... Yeah, well, that's the thing. The Bross documentary, it was like, because I think that we always try and pitch like comeback comedies. And then I'm like, like, com- you know, people trying to make their comebacks. And then I'm like, the real thing, like you can't beat it. You actually can't beat it because that Bross documentary is unbelievable. So good. And and Andrew Stone, like he 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 takes the, the camera crew on like a tour around his his flat. And he's like, this is where the magic happens. And it's everything in one room with like a fold out bed. Yeah. <laughs> and like a little portable hub. It's great because I can take this anywhere. So. Yeah. And yeah. They, Harry Hill did. Didn't Harry Hill put it on like TV? Yeah. Burp? Yeah. 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 Um, and Louis spends dancing down the corridor every time the drum beat comes on. He, his body. God. The other one that's like brilliant is the, to rewatch is the first series of pop stars. Oh, I saw you talk about this in in a in an interview because yeah. I also had noted down that you love Gemma Collins' show. <laughs> um, Diva. Um, um, uh, pop yeah, stars. pop stars. Pop stars is um, Jamie Dimitri, who, who I went to um, Bristol with, who does staff. He he and I like that was like our first sort of that's how we sort of became friends is by talking about that, our mutual love of pop stars right. and then he got me the DVD of the first series and so I watched the DVD which I also like do what you like with what you do with The Office like I watch it again every other year or I watch it with someone who hasn't seen it and that's also just I believe you can get the DVD really, of pop stars it's really yeah you get it I bought it for someone as a present recently it's very nostalgic because it's 2000. I think it's the year 2000 or 2001. So the clothing is like very specific, although like really hauntingly, like I think it's actually quite trendy now. Yeah, like, everything's I feel like coming people back are dr- in from that. I feel like weird. people are dressing now like they, they are in pop stars. But anyway, um, it's a lot of tank tops and a lot of like nice. those very full body trousers with pockets. All the way I, see, all the way I seem to remember Darius wearing a lot of denim. And then Darius is the, like, nothing, nothing is funnier than watching Darius (laughs) dancing and and singing. He's so tall and so sincere and such a prat. (laughs) It's just so funny. And it's, and it's, again, it's before, you know, X Factor and stuff became quite sort of, I mean, probably if you watch the first series of X Factor, it'd seem very dated now, but it's way before any of that kind of... Mm became like glamorous so it's just in like school village halls and you can see like the golden wanderers boxes and like plates <laughs> of like tuna sandwiches in the background they obviously give them for lunch it's it's very fun. There, there's this fun scene where this guy called warren is um like talking to camera he's got like a talking head and he's like oh god i'm so stressed about my my performance i can't like do it and they're filming it in a urinal and there's just a guy pissing <laughs> <laughs> and you're like how did that make the edit how but it has <laughs> and I absolutely loved that when it came out I watched every week and I was making like I was doing like bets at school to see who would get in the band like, who do you think is going to be in the final five I've lost it <laughs> for your own <laughs> I think that clip is on YouTube. I'm almost certain it is. If it, I try and find it and send it to you. Um, so stupid. Um, I should probably ask you some actual questions about you. Um, um, so, because we talked about, um, we briefly talked about Brass Eye. 
And I'm a massive Partridge fan. Like, I think Partridge is just like one of my all time favorite things ever. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. To the it point. It has to be. It must be. To the point where me and my dad bought the like complete scripts of like the first two, oh, three whoa. series, or whatever. But we realized we didn't need them because, because you knew we them. just like were quoting them. <laughs> <laughs> so it is it is the thing and also just the 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 most amazing way of just like that character is what 20 years old yeah and it's still regenerating like the podcast that he just brought out last year it was like making me cry yeah it's so good um but you were on partridge oh yes you were on this yes, time yes that was that was actually that was quite like oh my god how is this happening wow this is amazing I can't believe it here I am so here I am on the sofa because <laughs> you were also because wow. I, I I hadn't quite put it together surreal. I hadn't quite put together until I rewatched it last night that you were actually on the same episode as Jamie yes um, yeah and I, I think funny. we even were, were there at the same time filming it so that was really nice um, but we're very professional on set and we will not we do not speak to each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was very surreal because it's it's surreal like act like the whole thing was surreal anyway I don't know you know every, yeah. filming is just a weird job and then just sat on the sofa and being like that's the man that I've watched and, and laughed at for so long and now I'm having a conversation with him I don't know how this how this has happened. And is it is it more difficult as well because like I think in Partridge, most of the other characters around him are kind of playing straight roles in terms of like Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. So is that also quite difficult in terms of I mean um, to be honest, I was so nervous that actually like not having to be that funny was quite a sort of blessing. <laughs> Because I was like, I don't, I'm not the one who's, like, he's the funny one in the scene. So I can just sort of play the character straight and that's going to be easier for me than trying to, like, improvise and be the funny one who's, like, creating the the laughs, if you see what I mean. Because I was yeah. shitting. Like, I was just so, you know, it's so scary. And so I, even though I was such a small part, but I was still like, <laughs> oh, God. And then, um, and I, but actually, I wasn't. It's almost scar- scarier if you have to go in and be like, "Okay, what have you got? Are you funny?" Yeah, I suppose. Um, so that was sort of a relief in a way, I think. Okay, interesting. I didn't know which way around <laughs> it would be, but I guess it makes sense. Um, but yeah, I had to ask you about Partridge because you love it. Yes. Um, what's your favourite? Like... What's your favourite? Oh. That is difficult. I think for me, oh, I don't know. That is difficult. See, this is getting really like <laughs> in the weeds here because, like, obviously, I think the first two I'm Alan Partridge series are mm. always going to be like up there. Is that the chat show or the, the like the, sit- like the sitcom like yeah, after yeah. the chat show? That to me is the best. Uh, I think that's, that's like, the best. yeah, that's like, that's the thing you like always quote yeah. as a Partridge fan. But I think like you said, I think what's really great about I like that there is no, I don't think there really is any dud Partridge stuff. Yeah. Um, like, although that fa- was a worry doing it. Cause you don't want to be like in the one thing. Be, like, everyone in the one thing. Everyone's like, yeah, well that was shit. Although probably some people have thought that, didn't they? But like they, you know, like you're never going to please everyone. But it's but... also a bit of a worry every time as a fan as well, because you're like, is this going to be the one? Because they mm-hmm. haven't yet had one where it's like, oh God, this is terrible. Yeah. It's like, is you you worry every time something else comes out that it's like, is, yeah, it, is this going to be... Yeah, they're just going to ruin it. But um, it can't be, I guess it can't be now because there's been so many of them. It's like, well, you've always got, you know, even if you don't enjoy it that much, it's like, well, I can always go and rewatch this. Yeah. And that's great. And I and think, wait for the next thing. I think in a lot of ways, though, they have like evolved the character quite well. So he's not mm-hmm. really just like the same as he was um, in whenever it came out. I'm Alan Partridge came out or No Me No You came out, you know? It's yeah. like, um, 
they kind of like you said they kind of like reinvent it sort of every time a little bit and yeah so yeah i'm a big fan of a lot of the new stuff really like the mid-morning matters stuff and i thought this time was really good um yeah and actually i think is f- funnier the more i watch it like, yeah the more I think times i go back i think also like it, it for, sort of to me it worked in like that bit of that episode was absolutely genius that yeah. bit of that was amazing like that the bit where he's like the Irish farmer guy <laughs> is like yeah yeah, yeah. Um, throw me under the bus I've just died happy throw me under a bus I can die <laughs> <laughs> um, I can die a happy woman so going back to you again because we keep drifting Please. away from your stuff. <laughs> Do you like being interviewed or or I don't know. I don't know. I haven't made up my mind. Okay. I mean I I think that I what I'll do is I'll often like just be you know very chatty and like myself and then afterwards or, or afterwards I'll listen to it or I'll read it and I'll be like you repeat like you why <laughs> Why did you say that? Why did you sound like that? Why couldn't you just be cool? <laughs> why couldn't you just be like a, a nice, like chilled person? Like, why did you have to speak at 100 miles an hour and laugh 24 seven? I mean, it's good so, for me because I don't have to do much in terms of like... Often I, I, think, I think I enjoy it in the present and then afterwards I'll have a real sense of regret and remorse. Okay, good. Well, that's how I like to leave all my encounters. You don't, uh-huh. you don't have to deal with that side of things. So that's fine. As far as I'm aware, you've always done characters, right? You've never yes. sort of done stuff as yourself. No. Um, is that a? What's the reason behind that? I'm not gonna. That's is is it a sort of? Is it because of the love of other sort of character based comedy that has kind of yeah, shaped I that? Think, or I think so. I think I don't. I I really um. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't think it's anything like psychological. Like, I need a mask <laughs> to be in front of my audience. I can't be myself. I think it's more like I didn't want to be a stand-up. Right. I I, I really wanted to be like a comedy actor. Mm. That's that's what that's what my ambitions were for sure. Like I was always drawn to that in you know my childhood and like early teenage years. I was like wanted the comedy parts or like the weird character part or like you know did sketches and stuff so and I really enjoyed writing but I just didn't nothing I didn't find the thought of going up in front of an audience and being like anyway I was walking down even though I know that there's so much more to stand up than that and you could make it nuanced and weird and whatever it doesn't have to be just you and a microphone and just as a caveat I would love to be able to do that, but I just don't, I don't have a desire to, or, right. or like a, or like a, I don't think I could. Mm. So it's like, to me, it feels like a very pure, like an amazing, but totally alien, like art form to go up onto a stage and be completely yourself and be like, but it feels like a completely different thing from doing a character. And so right. I think I wanted to be like a comedy actor and I wanted to pursue that but I had absolutely no idea how to do it I was like what do you do like I I never thought I would go to drama school because I was like no one's going to let you in if you go and do like a Lynn from the office impression Lynn from Alan Partridge impression (laughs) like like the thought of going to like a drama school audition and picking like a monologue from Macbeth was like equally as haunting yeah so I was like you went to Bristol Uni right I went to Bristol and then I'm a I... Bristol, Bristol boy, so. Oh, you well, you grew Bristol. up there. Yeah. Oh, nice. You don't yeah. have a Bristol accent. No, I I I escaped without the Bristol accent. <laughs> That's probably though because I went to, um, I went to Bristol Grammar School, which is like. Oh right yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's center. like on the um, is it just the one just behind the Wills Building? Yeah. 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 I big, remember big that very vividly. Top of the hill. Yeah, I remember that. Um, that's so weird. I was probably 
like at Bristol Uni at the same time you were at school. I don't know. I don't know how old you are. I'm 25. So I've left, definitely left (laughs) by the time you were at school. So no, no, no. Actually, there was probably times when we crossed over. Isn't that strange? I think we may have like passed each other in the street. That is weird. Anyway. So at Bristol, I was doing like comedy parts in the plays and being like, but also at the same time being like, this isn't a career. Like I ne- I'll never do this as a career. I'll just, I'll just become a admin assistant. What and were you studying at uni? I did history of art. Okay. I thought that I would, you know, I just didn't know what I wanted to do basically. And then I met Jamie mm. and another girl called Charlie Perkins and they were doing a sketch show. They were taking up to Edinburgh and I was like, please, can I be in it, governor? <laughs> and so I, Jamie was like, yeah, but it'd be really good if you like wrote because we've had lots of people like wanting to be in it who just want to perform. But like, if, but like, it'd be great if you could write as well. So I was like, never really written that much before, but I'll try. So I did and I, I really enjoyed it. And then we went, we, we went to Edinburgh and we did the show and the sketch show and we almost like I think it was 99% death rate in terms of like how often we were dying in front of the audience um and I I found it very nerve-wracking and horrible but it was also like I'm actually doing comedy like I'm doing comedy acting this Mm. is great and then after I left I, I think I worked for like a um, a comedy um, like stand up um, when I say I think I know I worked for like a, <laughs> I think I may have <laughs> I did work for a um, like stand up club I worked at like a stand up club yeah. in Leicester Square Storm the Storm um, nightclub oh. in Leicester Square <laughs> is that even there anymore? I, I don't remember Storm in Leicester Square <laughs> you could get a um, burger from Ruby Blues Oh, yeah. You went to see the, the stand-up show, a glass of Prosecco, and entrance to the club storm. Right. For 25 quid. Good deal. <laughs> and I worked there, and I was like, I would just go and see the shows, and I'd be like, annoyingly, my doorbell's rung. Do you think I could just get it? Because I think yeah, it's sure. a package. Yeah, yeah, okay, on. I'll just be back. One sec. I missed it. Sorry about that. Sorry, I've made you miss your package. No, 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 it's fine. Let me just carry on this very long Ruby boring Blues. story. I was watching, working there. It was a bit of a stressful job. And I think I was just like, I'm young. Why am I doing it? I was working like seven days a week. And I was like 22. And I was like, I don't want to do this. Hell. Why don't I just like try and do gigs? And then I can get a job as a waitress and it won't be as sort of, full on mm. so I did that then I started like waitressing and then I would also do gigs and then that that's sort of just where and then I wrote an Edinburgh show and went to Edinburgh and then that's sort of where that happened but I don't think it was a desire to like be a comedian it was more of a like I think this is probably the best way in which I can pursue like a career in yeah being a comedy performer if you see what I mean yeah good answer um <laughs> Um, good very long meandering answer um yeah because i i've tried stand up a bit yeah um and i think i'm maybe in the same sort of place with it in terms of like i'm not actually sure if it's like that i really want to do stand up necessarily yeah. although anytime i watch uh, like Stuart Lee or someone I'm like oh, yeah. I want to do that but yeah. um, because like whenever I tried it I was sort of doing like semi character semi sort of like I'd yeah. like start as me and then turn into like a Bristolian yeah. driving instructor so <laughs> so like <laughs> you were kind you of were always... kind of you were kind of bit straddling both yeah and like I don't know I don't know. Yeah, I think you have to do these things for a while, don't you? But like, I don't know if like either worked quite 
well enough because I wasn't yeah. sort of committing to either. You know what I mean? It was kind yeah, of Yeah, but I think if one. you can do both, then that'd be amazing. And also if you could find a way to like intertwine them. I, I think a lot of, there's a, there's a really good um, American stand-up called John Early. Okay. Who's, who does both. Like he'll kind of be a stand-up and then he'll kind of go into different characters while he's, yeah. while he's kind of talking. And I like that was just like amazing to watch because I was like, that's because you don't need any props or wigs or like lighting cues mm. or like, sh- you know, like the most annoying thing, like being a character comedian is like going to the venue like three hours early to do tech because you're like, I- I'm sorry, I need these cues <laughs> and having like a script. And it's just, and then seeing like a stand up, like rock up and just go yeah. on stage with a beer and be like, anyway, this. It's like, God, I envy you so. I wish I could do that. And then he was like kind of doing both, but not needing all of the sort of um, accoutrements. Accoutrements, exactly. Yeah. He was just sort of doing doing it like very in a very sort of chilled. Well, I take my hat off to you, John Early. Way. So you're doing a show with Tash Dimitriou. You were supposed yes. to film it last year, right? But I, obviously yes. that didn't happen. Yeah, it didn't happen, and so hopefully we can do it soon um and um get it out it's all it's written it's just finding the time to like actually do it is is proving challenging but hopefully it'll get done it, well, who's that what, who's that for what's that where's it's that going? for bbc so no. it'll be on bbc three I feel like I just saw that that's going to be a channel again. Yeah, I thought that. But then no one has spoken about it and no, I've had no conversations with anyone about it. My friend it, so. who works at the BBC, albeit yeah. doing like software development for the website, yeah. um, says that it is. So Yeah, well, yeah, I think it is. I did see it on the, on the BBC News. So I guess it will be on TV, although no one watches anything on TV anymore. So it seems mad, but... Um, it will be on BBC Three. I think they probably didn't. They probably didn't. I think they thought that no one really watched BBC Three, and then as soon as it went online, everyone was like, "Oh no! Like, there's lots of good stuff on BBC Three." And but then, but it. then people, what people watch it online? Well, yeah. I don't know. So it doesn't need to be on TV because if you if if it's on TV, you have to watch it at a certain time, and then it just goes on iPlayer anyway, which is how you usually watch stuff, unless you're watching a footy game. But is there still need to watch that is there life. still like a sort of uh, like because we can both remember things not being online yeah. all the time, right? And so, is there still like a little bit of like a feels more attractive if it's on TV sort of thing? Like it's it's like oh, we're on TV kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think so because I think I. I sometimes sort of t- say to like my parents or my parents' friends, I'm like, they're like, what are you up to at the moment? And I'm like, oh, I'm doing, I'm writing a show and it's going to be, you know, it's actually going to be made. And they're like, well, what channel is it on? Oh, it's going to be on iPlayer. Oh, okay. But it, it might actually get shown on BBC One. Oh, well, fantastic. <laughs> I'll be tuning in. Their eyes light up. Yeah. Oh, well, brilliant. If it's on BBC One, I will be tuning in, won't I? <laughs> Okay, well, I, you're going to hate it, so please don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just like telling people that you're doing a show and then just sort of telling them about it and watching their faces be like, well, I know that I'll never watch that. <laughs> uh, my mum's like, you're very down on yourself, Ellie. You're very down on yourself. Um, like, what, what did you think of the, what did you think of that um, show that I did last week? I didn't enjoy it <laughs> at all. <laughs> It wasn't my cup of tea. No, she's she's a great mom. Um, I should probably, because we sort of uh, earmarked it for conversation earlier. Mm. Je- je- you apparently you love Gemma Collins' Total Diva Forever program. Is that what it's called? Total Diva Forever? I don't know. It's a yeah, weird show, um, right? I, I mean, I do really like that show but it's i probably exaggerated my Ah, love of it for that interview because i can't really remember even like what it's called but i do remember i do i mean that like i've watched like a lot of it because i only bring it up so entertaining i only bring it up because my hope with Gemma collins is that she turns out to be like 
a character all along. Yeah, yeah. And like, yeah. it, it was I mean, all a big, like. The character. thing is, though, is that don't you think that it is like a persona? Yeah, sure. But like, I want it to be like <laughs> so far removed from like who she actually is. Yeah. To make it. I don't want to like slag off Gemma because that feels mean. But you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> she's not listening. No, um, I completely, I completely know what you mean. Yeah, she, <laughs> she's your number one fan. Yeah. Um, She'll be gutted. Yes, when this I comes do know out. what you mean. I do know what you mean. But it's there's there's also something that makes you go like, I cannot believe someone is like that. Yeah. There is someone in the world that is there. Is well, I know it's not even like I have to think. Gemma Collins is. Gemma Collins. She is Gemma Collins every day of her life. Mm. It's mad how mad she is and entertaining. <laughs> when she like rings up, and I don't know whether she's got like a slight smile on her face, but she rings up her agent and is like berating him about the fact that she's not in Madame Two Swords. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's about time. And you're like, is that like, is part of you like does part of you know that this is really cheeky like does part of you know that you're being the cheekiest girl in the world right now or are you so entitled that you're like you woke up and you were like i need to why aren't i in love and two swords like why i don't know what's better really like i think it might be funnier if she is just that entitled like i'm not in Madden two swords but i also like the idea that she's like wouldn't it be funny if i got angry about this today yeah. And just yeah. see if I could get in Madame Two Sword. Well, yeah, well, yeah. I, I think that she I think she probably does not to get too serious about it, but she probably does have like some mental health issues. I think she I that, think that's why I was careful not to want to like slag her off because I feel that are, like along the lines of, you know, feeling extreme feelings. Mm. And because there was that thing on Big Brother, wasn't there, where she would like fl- had a hissy fit about her hair straighteners. And it was like, you can't behave like that. I, all like, I remember from that big brother was her running around the garden with like a Shetland pony or something. <laughs> That's all I remember. <laughs> I don't remember that, but um, it was... I'm sure it's a gift yeah, she now. got She threw like a massive hissy fit because they'd given her like a curling iron instead of strengtheners. And she, she like blew up. And you kind of think where does that come from yeah if not you feel you 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 feel things you got like hypersensitivity disorder or like mixed with sort of narcissistic personality disorder or something like that that means you're mad but hugely entertaining no she there was a really funny like like snippet that i saw that she was it wasn't on the gc Gemma collins and it was like it was like diva forever that's what it's called she's walking down the street and she's seen, and there's two guys, it's, it's during like lockdown last year and therefore, it must be on Diva Forever actually, but it was online and she's walking down the street and there are these two guys coming towards her and they're like, oh my God, Gemma Collins and they try and come towards her. She's like, no darling, we can't, no, it's lockdown, no, social distancing. And she's like, all right guys, Corona. And she like waves <laughs> and she says Corona like that as if Corona <laughs> is like her new goodbye. Corona. <laughs> and that really made me laugh. So there you have it, Ellie White. My thanks to Ellie for joining me on the show. My thanks to you, the listener, for joining me uh, for this episode. Um, I'm sure you're wondering, uh, listening to the podcast, what Ellie's thoughts were on the finale of like, if you're if you're a Line of Duty watcher, that is, uh, the Line of Duty finale was was uh, somewhat controversial. Um, so I will be asking Ellie what she thought of the end of Line of Duty. And, uh, if I, if I get her response, I will let you, the listener, know what her thoughts were on the end of Line of Duty. If you haven't watched Line of Duty, uh, then that won't mean anything to you. So there you have it. Um, 
if you like the show, then please do subscribe uh, on whatever podcast platform you're listening on or subscribe on YouTube if you're listening to this on YouTube. Um, uh, share it with your friends. Share it with your family. Share it with the people on the street. Tell them about the podcast. If you really, if you really, really like the show and you want to help us out, then you can go to patreon.com forward slash the last line to donate to the show and uh, chuck us a few of your hard-earned pounds or dollars or other currencies like euro so that's it for now thank you for joining me i've been james alban and this is the last line